This is John Zaninovich. Welcome to Move My Mass. You'll be hearing from great guests talk about balancing life and being fit. Welcome to another episode of Move My Mass. For all you gravel riders out there, today is going to be a great episode. I have a guest today that is a general manager of Action Sports here in Bakersfield. He is owner of Sam Barn Promotions because that is his big gig uh, as a race promoter. And speaking of race promotions, the big race, Rock Cobbler, is coming up. And so I'd like to welcome Sam Ames. And let's get into the Rock Cobbler. Thanks for having me, Johnny. Yeah, well. Thank you for coming on. So you have to tell me, how did you come up with the Rock Cobbler? What brought up the idea? And because it is an insane race, what brought it on? So for a little bit of background, you know, event promotion stuff I've been doing for a long time. You know, we've doing races out at Hart Park and bringing people to Kern County for, I don't know, 10 years in recent, well, 12 years in recent time, and then even back in the early 90s. So I've always had a thing to want to put on an event. I like where I live. I love showcasing Bakersfield, and we've got a lot of cool places. So there was a, uh, to talk specifically about the cobbler, there was an event in San Diego, still goes on, as you know, Belgian Waffle Ride. So we heard about it through another mutual cycling friend, and a couple of buddies went to, to go ride the event and check it out. It was pitched as a sort of road race with dirt gravel sections, and but you do it on a road bike. And so we kind of thought, well, this is right up our alley because we like to do stuff like that. We never heard of any event like that. So we went down and had an amazing time. It was really difficult. Um, and if literally a few weeks after, or I guess maybe even later in the fall, um, went out on sort of our local adventure rides with a few friends and started talking about, you know, we could do something like that here, but, but more dirt, have it be more adventurous. And a buddy of mine, um, I can remember like it was yesterday, he was maybe 15 feet behind me and we're throwing around names. And he said, well, why don't we call it the Rock Cobbler? We all stopped, looked at each <laughs> other. And it's just a, you know, pivotal moment of like, that's it. That's the name. That's but what we're going to call it. It describes the ride perfectly. Yeah. So the Rock Cobbler, did, from, from year one, this will be our eighth year coming up, has always been about having a lot of fun and making it insanely difficult. So what they call gravel bikes and gravel rides um, is, is very much a Midwest. Like they have true gravel roads, big giant rolling gravel roads. And you know, they just basically aren't paved. And that's sort of where gravel as we know it started, but on the West coast and in certain parts of the country, it's, it's just different everywhere. We don't have that element here in Kern County. So we just piece together areas in the foothills and places in East Bakersfield and wherever we can find, road dirt, road dirt, road dirt, predominantly dirt, um, and put it together. So it kind of falls into the gravel category, but it's really more of like an adventure ride. And every year we try to make it harder. And every year we try to do more goofy <laughs> stuff with shenanigans. And So let's get into that. Yeah. Let's talk about a couple things here, how hard it is. Uh, kind of glossed over that pretty quickly. I've done it twice. Uh, one time I was in shape for it. It was still extremely difficult. One time you were off the couch for it. One time I did it <laughs> when I should have done it, and it almost killed me. But it is truly a difficult race no matter what. It's yeah. When you're out there on the course with those guys and girls, the whole time we're, you're being cussed left and right. Just, and you know that. Yeah. You called every name in the book. Yeah. But get into the shenanigans. Get into some of the hike bikes Tell me. Tell the listeners what makes this thing different than even just a normal adventure race or versus a gravel ride? These shenanigans yeah. are crazy. So the cobbler has a reputation in, in you know, it, uh, I'm trying to be the best way to describe it, as a reputation for being really off the radar in terms of what we do and how we do it. And we, and we like that reputation. Um, we feed on it every year to find new stuff. So 
instead of just putting together a ride that starts and ends and it's got X amount of feet of climbing and it's got this, we, we, we know some of that's just going to fall into place no matter what, but we try to look at how, how can I, how can I do it differently? So if I have, I'm going to go up this hill, how many times can I go back down and back up and back down and back up? And, you know, if there's eight hills together, can I link those? So we, we're constantly just trying to find ways to make it very, very difficult. And, you know, we've had some seasoned pros and riders that have been all over the world doing other events. And they always say, I had a lot of fun. Like you guys insert, insert shenanigans and good times and water balloons and throwing darts. And just, we come up with all kinds and of crazy stuff. And have beach balls. And beach balls. And, while and, they're trying to climb up a hill. But in that, bike. yeah. And, but in that, we always say, look, first and foremost, it's a really, really hard adventure ride. And so um, we're known for our hike a bike. So a hike a bike is, you know, got to pick the bike up and hike up a hill. And from from year one to now, um, we've had a few less, you know, less difficult ones. But each year, I think I try to always find a new. We have an endless supply of hike a bikes, so I always try to find a new one. And um, and it usually comes towards the end of the ride when everybody is pretty shattered. And they got to do this and spend, you know, five to 10 minutes hiking up this hill. that's insanely steep. So, yeah, I get I get a, I get a few uh, right. few right. choice words thrown at me for the day and usually followed by a hug and can't wait to come back next year. Yeah. So uh, it is truly yeah. amazing. What tell me your favorite shenanigan up to now out of all the races? What's what's been your favorite for, uh, for our feedback? I, I think my favorite shenanigan when we first started, we had people do push ups, but we only had maybe 75 people. So it was kind of easy to get them to go along with, hey, you, yeah. guys, you know, we were, we made them collect tickets. So you couldn't get a ticket, you know, if you didn't do your 15 push ups or 10 push ups or whatever it was. But that became harder to, to do and it became harder to keep the ride moving. So we sort of went away from that. So I liked the push ups, but I think the, the funniest one, the best shenanigan one for me was the beach balls. Just that because one was it was really good. It was so unique. I mean, we, it, there's a local bicycle club called the Brown Monkeys and um, uh, largely Filipino guys, and but tons of other people from Bakersfield. And they really have quite a little uh, cool club. And they're just such good people and good fans and good supporters. So I tasked them with this beach ball and they sponsored the beach balls and we put their logo on it. And everybody got, everybody that entered the ride got a beach ball. And then they, they spent all this time with their kids blowing up all these beach balls and strung snow fencing, you know, up and down the hike a bike. And, and as people were coming up, they'd roll them down and kids would go down and get them. I mean, it was, it was they quite were, a spectacle. If I remember, I was across the canyon from that act. You want to call yeah, it something? Act is, I right. think there were hundreds of beach balls. Hundreds. So to give, I think I ordered a thousand. Beach yeah, balls. to give li- listeners perspective, they're climbing up a hundred foot hill, more or less. Yeah, I'd say a hundred feet. Where you have, to, you have to th- put the bike over your shoulder to get up it. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you're at the top, we've got a yeah. bunch of people rolling beach balls down the hill at yeah, you. pretty much. You're already shattered. Yeah, you're tired. They're coming at you. Yeah. So you, <laughs> know, half, the you know half the crowd's probably laughing and enjoying it. Another half is like, I'm going to kill Sam when I come by. Right, him. right. When I get to the end of this thing, he's dead. Because the trick is to find things that are that are that that you can get a grin or a laugh out of people. Right. Um. And, and the automatic that most people would say, well, how can you say that riding through your living room wasn't the biggest shenanigan? So we, we've ridden through two houses so far, my personal residence and a friend of mine's house, which was a major surprise. So that's a pretty good shenanigan. But um, and, and that got us really kind of on a global map. There's a um, platform called GCN, Global Cycling Network, and they, they heard about it and picked it up. And did a little story on the cobbler. And so the whole riding through the living room, like, I mean, literally through the living room, um, was, was, was probably a game changer for us. But I, I still love the beach ball. I just, yeah. there's something about it. And so this ride started first year, 75 riders? 40, 49. 49, 49 riders. 50, yeah, right, our very first year. And now it's going to be coming up in 2021. It'll be how many? Well, we're shooting for... 425, 450, you know, set registration at 400. Um, we have had, it's a pretty crazy year, of course. And, and uh, the, I've had see, some people say that your event was the last one we did last year and it'll be the first one we do this year. 
So provided we execute, which which I feel pretty confident about, we've got a ton of protocol in place. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably more protocol than some urgent cares have. So I um, feel good that we'll roll. So yeah, that, if we get to 450, that that would be awesome. Well, you were so you didn't just go from managing action sports to putting on the rock collar. No, I, I did mention that you are state champion cyclocross. Correct. Yep. But yeah. Tell me the progression. How did you go from road riding, road cycling, cyclocross to wanting to do something like this? Is it just to make that leap from cyclocross courses to let's blow this thing up? So the best way to answer that is I, I got to give you the history. I got into cycling in 1985 saw a bike race on TV, which, by the way, was a real famous French race called Perry roubaix where you have to ride over cobblestones, and it's generally the weather plays into it. So there's, if you go back to the very first time sitting in my mom's you know, living room watching Perry roubaix on TV, these guys are getting smashed by the wind, they're covered in mud, they're riding over cobblestones. So it's almost a precursor to you know, where I'm at now with doing some of the stuff that we do. But uh, I got into the sport, you know, I quit playing baseball um, and found cycling and just never looked back. So raced in Europe for a little bit, raced domestically a lot, uh, gave it a shot, you know, kind of wanted to go pro, but I didn't really have that last little 5% of discipline that I think is really, really needed. I think maybe the talent was there, but it was also a difficult time. There wasn't a lot of structure. I didn't mm-hmm. have places to yeah, coaching that I needed and living in Europe by yourself was, you know, there were no other Americans. Um, so it was, it was kind of lonely and it, and it was just easy to come home and um, got into working professionally in the restaurant business, spent a lot of time there, but always kept riding the bike and staying on the bike and doing all that. So fast forwarding to where I'm at now with uh, working at, uh, at Action Sports, which has been, you know, a massive supporter of my events. Um, we, we did some of the cycle cross races and we did some other stuff. And it really was for me traveling. I'd go to LA or go to Northern California and there's pool races. And I thought, Bakersfield's got a lot to offer. We have really good cycling here. We do. And, and we can bring some people here for road cycling, mountain biking, cyclocross at the time, and now gravel. So to answer the other part of your question, the cycle cross races are always my favorite. It's my favorite discipline. Um, I had some pretty good success in that. and it was sort of stalling out. It, it, it was hard to get people to come to Bakersfield for cross races. And we had, I really think, one of the top courses in the state. And we'd get people that would come and they were all very pleased with the course. And, you know, it's like, oh, this is a you know European style course and it's fast yeah. and it's hard. Yeah. It always made it, you know, same thing, made it more difficult. But um, it was hard to get people here. And when we discovered Belgian Waffle Ride, that kind of set off the light bulb of, you know, keeping things innovative, you have to do something new. If you're just doing the same thing all the time and it's the same ride every year. So the cobbler was an evolution of a light bulb going off for me that said, change it every year. So our route is different every year. Um, we do different things for it every year. So I, I love that. And, yeah. and the rider base, and my, my, I call them my customers, you know, I've made a lot of friends over the years with all the events. But I really like treating them like customers. They look for that innovation. They're, they, you know, they get excited like it's building right now. Like, oh, what's he going to do? Where are we going to go? Some elements of the course stay the same every year, but what's he going to give us? I give him a really cool gift every year. So it's, that's fun. It's, if you don't innovate with that and make it different all the time, it's easy for stuff to get stale. Yeah, so speaking of making it more difficult, things like that, I think I know the answer to this question, but can the weekend warrior go out and do the rock collar? Yeah, you did it. You know, yeah, I mean, you're, I, a, you're I, a, I died. Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people die. Yeah. I mean, the, the attrition rate of, of DNS did not finish is, is, I wouldn't say it's huge. I mean, yeah, what a lot is, of people, I don't even know. What is the uh, DNF percentage uh, in that? Uh, I knew you were going to ask me that. And I don't know the exact More number, but I'm going to say it's, if we had foreign people, it's 5%. You know, it, yeah. maybe, maybe 10%. So out of 400, you know, 40 people didn't finish. Sometimes people don't finish because of mechanical failure. There's other right. things besides the physical attribute. Yeah, it is a very, uh, yeah. parts of the course can be very rough on a bike. Rough on equipment. So can, you know, 
in the weekend warrior do it absolutely but you you got to have some degree of base and the thing that really gets most people about the cobbler even if they're really good cyclists you know they're they're very fit or they're they race mountain bike or do the things is it's so uh punishingly difficult with load like mu- like muscle load so yeah. we do so many short steep climbs and hike a bike that the thing that i hear from people after the event is like you know backs killing them they're they're hurt in places they don't normally hurt because they're using muscles they don't normally use, but they have so much, you know, weightlifting torque going on on the bike. I right. mean, the, the hills are all, most of them are insanely steep and um, we're just kind of blessed with that. So yeah, I'm sadistic and I throw it at them. And, yes, yeah, you are. You can get through it, but it's, it, it's going to be a very long day. The average finishing time is, you know, seven hours. So the That's fastest average. guys are five and change. Yeah. And you've got some people out there for nine. And to put this into perspective, this year's course is, what would you say, 88 miles? So I, I think if my math is right, we have some tweaking to do, and there's always a few yeah. last-minute changes that are just unavoidable. But to be safe, I'll say we'll be between 85 and 90 and okay. over 8,000 feet of climbing. That's so, insane. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a good day. And like you say, it's not just – you're not getting on a 4% grade and climbing no. for an hour and a half. No. You're on – percent or yeah. i don't know how steep some of them are but some of them are yeah 20 25 yeah that's straight up yeah yeah and when you've done it for the eighth time of the day yeah your body's just like or the 28th no. yeah or the 28th time <laughs> yeah we i haven't had the final tally on short steep hills but it's over 20 and and you know there are a lot of them are anywhere from 30 seconds to a couple minutes each and just yeah this stacks up right getting tired talking to <laughs> no, I mean too. Me too. So let's just switch into the food. What's it? Tell me about the food at this event. What's it going to be like? So we, uh, you know, what we, has it been like? That's always this event. Always has a fun after party. Yeah, always. It'll be a little different. Yeah. It'll of be course, a little different. Of you know, um, I think when I go to an event, I, when I go to an event, not just a bike race. Because bike racing, bike racing is. You know, it's maybe like triathlon. You you get in the car on the plane, or you know, you go you prepare for your event, you do your event, and you leave. And then maybe you go out to eat, or you have beers with buddies, or do something. We will always, always from day one, even when we did some of the racing, we wanted to incorporate both elements. We wanted people to come and get stuff that they same thing, innovating that they weren't finding at other places. So we started a little grill entity that's part of the promotions company uh, called Gear Grinder Grill. So. We do food at everything that we put on and we try to really give them stuff that we know they're going to like because we like it. So we feel like, you know, they're going to have a great experience with, with a really good meal that they wouldn't expect or wouldn't have the same level. And uh, we've branched that into another whole subject. But yeah, we'll, you know, we'll do our world famous, you know, Belgian style fries and uh, we'll cook up some, or probably some tri-tips and chicken again and See, I big healthy know. salads and, you know, like, all good stuff. I left, that out of your, I left that out of your intro on purpose because your intro could have gone on forever. Everything you've, yeah. you've accomplished and what you do in life. But yeah, owning and operating Gear Grinder Grill uh, is part of what makes all this happen. The camaraderie you have with your friends that help you run it. I'm in there sometimes whenever I can be. But that, the Gear Grinder Grill, Sandbarn Promotions getting together those are some of the things that make these events just get bigger and bigger more diabolical because sometimes you <laughs> you feed you know you just keep feeding us <laughs> ideas and literally, like literally right, let's get right yeah. let's get bigger here yeah and yeah the the frites you serve at these events are amazing yeah i can sit here and talk about food for a long time we, we really could, sure if we should we could branch this away from <laughs> fitness and into food easily um yeah it's it's we're really lucky i'm i'm incredibly lucky for a good core group of friends and people that that like a lot of the same stuff that i do. and and i and i think it's a testament to an event like the cobbler and and stuff that we put on where we're always trying to find ways to have hospitality and i grew up in it worked in it forever i'm still working in it customer service and hospitality, treating riders like customers, really giving them a solid experience from the beginning to the end is just, I love that. Like I, I feed off of that. It's what 
motivates me in so many facets of my life. And yeah, you know, no pun intended, but I do wear a lot of hats because I like the adventure um, and I like the challenges, but I love, I love people walking away from something and just having a great time. And, and whether they're buying a bike for me at the shop or we're putting on the cobbler or we're making fries or I love that. It, it's just the well, thing that really makes me happy. And, you know, you mentioned it earlier, but the way this show houses, showcases uh, Bakersfield and Kern County is phenomenal. Yeah. You know, you, you start the ride in a, in a city, you go through foothills, go through mountains, and you, you get to see a lot of terrain, different terrain that you're not going to see in a lot of other rides. Yeah, it's pretty varied. And, you know, we're blessed. The east side, of, predominantly everything happens on the east side, you know, northeast and east side um, is great, you know. We're lucky enough we're able to put together a route like like we do. Um, I I love showcasing Kern County and Bakersfield. I lived here my whole life. Um, people come and we always do it in February. So yeah. people come and they, you know, typically we've had some rains. So things have greened up a little bit. It's a really good time of year. It's honestly the only time of year it really works for a number of reasons. But one of the things is when people come, they're like, I, you know, I've driven through Bakersfield. Armpit of California, all the jokes that you hear for, you know, those your, comments are nonstop. Your, yeah, but we, non-stop. we get the opposite. You know, mm-hmm. people come and I get emails following up afterwards uh, about the event, which is a nice compliment. But I do get a lot of pretty cool compliments about Bakersfield where people would say, I didn't realize there was so many orange trees or I didn't realize there was this or those big giant hills. And and, and I like that because yeah, I didn't realize your bike path was like yeah, that. I didn't realize yeah. we were going to ride through that beautiful park. I didn't realize it's just never ending. And that is one of the best things being a part of the ride, Albert, because yep. you know, you're showcasing that. So we've been talking about how difficult this ride is. If you were to, and even though somebody can do it, not in great shape, I really highly not recommend, you know, don't do that. Get in shape to do this thing. Yeah. What should someone, how should someone train for this? Is it just base miles? That'll do the trick. Or how would you, if you can just, Develop the perfect plan. What should someone do? Prepare for this course. So general cycling fitness is is a given. Like you, you got to spend time in the saddle. You got to be riding. Um, you, you've got to have a base. I mean, it's that's uh, tough. Quite you have to have everything. Like there's there's no easy way to cheat the cobbler in terms of fitness. Now I'm not talking about you know world-class performance i'm just saying to get through the day and sort of make it worthwhile you have to have some level of base fitness for cycling and do all that but you also have to have a fair amount of skill you know the ride's technical the dirt sections that we do incorporates elements that i like and things that i like and i always am very upfront with the rider base once they register i send them this email and says look i hope you've been training you know you might be really really fit but it's going to be technical. Like you have to have mountain bike level skills. You got to be prepared for off-road hazards. You've got a, a lot's going to get thrown at you because we cover every possible terrain there is. So the advice yeah. to somebody that wants to get into it, and I do get a lot of new people that say, oh, I'm going to think about getting a new gravel bike and I want to try it. I, I tell them because most of the time they've looked at gravel and I, I say, yeah, everything you've learned about gravel ride is the opposite of what the cobbler is. It's, <laughs> it's not... See, now we're, now Dude, I like this because we're really getting window. into it. For now yeah, we're really getting into what the rock I, I say if, you, is. If, if you envision these, um, uh, you know, rolling hills of Kansas and um, the Midwest and you're going to do in, in Italy and you're going to do gravel rides, like a, it's not, not like that at all. So it's actually, I would say the elements are more mountain bike than they are anything else. We do cover all the different types of terrain, but they've got to have bike handling skills. They've got to have a, a decent fitness base to get through it. And I do tell them specifically, you know, because I was saying earlier about the torque load on the muscles, you're having to do so much, you know, uh, high torque, um, low speed climbing um, and, and muscle load stuff. I tell them that's what some of the stuff they need to be doing, you know, and, and if they've never gotten off and hiked with their bike, they need to go find a hill and, and do that every week. Like at least once a week, go hike up something for five to 10 minutes, you know. And, yeah, and just to give them a heads up, these hikes are... You're using your legs and your hands usually in front of you. That's, it's that steep. We try to get them pretty steep. Yeah. yeah, you're not just throwing it over your shoulder and walking up a hill. It's so steep, you're normally, you got your hand on the hill in front of you, and you're just trying to get up it. 
Yeah, and sometimes. If you, slip, if you slip, sometimes you can go back two or three feet. Yeah, there's one particular, the, the, the famous hike a bike that we've used twice now um, has that element. As you get towards the very top, it's, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, so that can happen. I can't uh, re- divulge too much of what this year's course hike a bike looks like. But uh, yeah, the, the fitness base starts with, you know, being a, you get, being a cyclist first and foremost, there's a lot of pedal time. But the technical part, you know, I really tell people it's not a fitness based thing, but you got to have those skills also. Or, and, and be prepared and, you know, ride within your limit because it's challenging it. If you get right. in a section where, or a gully or a downhill or something that you're not comfortable with, you know, slow your roll a little bit. And yeah. Get off if you have to. So let's get technical a little bit. What's the perfect bike? Not the brand or anything like that, but what's the perfect setup? Higher size, gear. Because I know we have some listeners that, hey, man, I want to. What's yeah. the perfect setup for this? So what would that be? What would you ride? For me, it's it's 100% a gravel bike with what is what is called a gravel bike now. And if, before gravel bikes existed, we were riding our cycle cross bike. So a, a, ty- a bike that's got enough tire clearance for like a, a minimum of a 34 millimeter up to a 40 millimeter tire for off road usage. And there's now there's a gazillion tire choices, and there's a bunch of different bike choices. Some people that come and do the event bring a mountain bike. And, and I tell people, you bring whatever tool you have in the shed. That's right. You don't have to go buy a new bike to do this. Don't, don't bring a road bike because that would be a really bad idea. Um, but some people are more comfortable on a mountain bike. I, I tell the riders the challenge of the ride is doing it on this type of bike, is doing it on a cross slash gravel bike because that's what we ride and that's what we think adds to the challenge. A mountain bike doesn't make the ride easier. It might make it um, more manageable for some people from a technical standpoint. Bigger tire, they feel more comfortable with some of the descending doing that. Um, a good majority of the ride is off-road. So if that's what they have and they're more comfortable doing it, by all means. For me, it's the challenge. I, I, I want to know if I can negotiate this section on this type of bike. That's, that's kind of how we started. We're, we're always out doing a bunch of crazy, goofy rides that most people would do on a mountain bike on this type of machine. Yeah. So for me, that's that's the choice. I like a you know thirty six to forty millimeter tire these days. You know, didn't exist five or six years ago. You know, you didn't have that sort of a tire choice. So now you do, and now you got a lot of options. And so I I tell people, look, if you've got the gravel bike or you're thinking about doing it, bring it. But just know there's going to be mountain bike elements and technical stuff. Yeah. So let's get into what you do. Let's talk about you're you're crazy busy. Yeah, working all the time in action sports, running Sam Barn, working your your grinding grill events now and then. How do you stay fit now? How do you incorporate your fitness into your daily life? So the older I've gotten, um, the the harder it gets, and that sounds kind of cliche, I suppose. But you know, so I was it's racing. It's common. It's, it's common. racing and training a lot up until I was thirty, well, forty, I guess, early forties. And I'd always made jokes with the buddies that I raced with as, as sort of like masters racers and staying uber fit and trying to keep up with all the other fast guys around that when I turned 50, I'm done. And I, and I, and I stuck to that. I, I shut it down. You know, the motivation to, to be that level of fit wasn't there anymore. Um, other endeavors in life, just, you know, I, I'd done that. Yeah. I've been racing my bike since I was 16 years old. I'm, I'm, I'm done. You know, it's yeah. now I love it and will always be, you know, I hope to the day I die, I'm riding a bicycle, but, um, you know, yeah, I, I wear a lot of hats. I'm, I'm, I'm curious by nature. I have my hands in a lot of different things. Um, action sports is, is job number one. That's, it's a, that's my biggest dedication. And that's really the epicenter of, of my professional life now. Um, and the responsibilities I have there are, are important. So I have to fit in training and working out and I don't even like the word training anymore just getting in a workout or doing something yeah. really wherever I can. And it, I struggled with it the last few years. It's been hard to sort of find the rhythm that I used to have, right. you know, got lazier, not quite on top of it. Um, but in the last six months, uh, I have sort of gotten in a bit of a niche. You know, I'm, I'm back to being pretty consistent on the workout, losing a few pounds, kind of get stuff going. So I, you know, I fit it in wherever I can. Predominantly, it's mornings um, after about noon to one o'clock, which 
you know, most days I'm busy from 10 to seven anyway, the ship sailed. Like I'm not an evening workout guy. Used to be, right. I'd be the guy to get on the trainer at home and, and say, oh, I didn't get my workout in this morning. So I'll go do 30 or 45 minutes. Or more. Yeah. But it's, it's sort of like it in the morning. Like I think a lot of people start their day that way and get it and get it rolling. So I fit it in um, three to four times a week and predominantly AM. And, and some, some weeks are better than others. But, um, right. you know, if I get Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday is, is sort of my routine. And I've, you know, I've mentioned this on every episode that that's what Move My Mass is all about. That's why I've started it is finding that balance from the days of hammering the training, hammering the workouts for an event, whatever it might be in somebody's life yeah. to, all right, now we're trying to find some balance. We don't need to hit it that hard anymore. So how do I balance it out? And every, you know, everybody I have on here has, has their different answers. Um, but, and I know that, you know, when we go out on weekends, sometimes we hit it hard, sometimes we don't. Yeah. And that's what it's all about because yeah, some days before we even go out, you'll text me, Hey, I want to do two or three hours tomorrow. I'm keeping my wheels on tonight. Yeah. And that's, <laughs> but that's the nice thing. That's the way it should be. And other times we're not going to keep our wheels on. Yeah. So, you know, one of the things I love about move my mass and when you sort of started doing this, that sort of struck a chord with me and I, and I hope it's a success for the lifestyles that people have was, was that is it's balance. You know, your logo shows balance and, and we look at life and we, and we have to have those balances. Like I was selfish previously, you know, and just had a young and family. And even yeah. before that, when I didn't, that was it, man. I, there was no going out on the weekends. It was, I was pretty regimented and pretty, um, pretty dedicated to what I was doing. And that's, that's great, but there's a lot of other stuff in life and, and not so much just work, but just, you know, obviously family and yeah. other hobbies and things that you kind of want to do. So, so I guess that balance now is really more important than ever before, but it's easy to get, it's easy to fall off that wagon, you know, and, and get into a routine where you kind of rest on your laurels of, Oh, I've always been kind of fit. Oh, it's this and that. And the pounds kind of start coming on. And then you, you know, your brain wants to go ride 50 miles with the guys and your legs are going, yeah, it's not happening. It's not. Um, and so you, you kind of get humbled and, and you, you sort of circle back, which is what happened with me is I went through several years of not making it a priority. And I was like, yeah, I think I, I think I need to make this a priority again, but in a very um, digestible way. So right. I like killing myself. So, so I'm going to ask, saying Balance. that, do you ever get the itch? As you start, your fitness starts coming on a little bit, you're getting consistent. Does it, when you're out there riding, see you're riding to work, or think, maybe I would like to go ride this event. I, I don't even know the name of one, but yeah, yeah there's it all. Oh, you know, one more time, maybe. One more time, I maybe go do that. Does that ever hit? Do the, you ever get the itch? The racing itch is gone. Like, right. that I could... I could care less about going and trying to, to, you know, beat somebody at something. I definitely have desires to want to go do events. Um, you know, talk What's, about the cobbler kind of like gravel sort of things and rides right. because they're social. You, yes. you know, the day is as hard as you, the ride is going to be hard, but yes. the day is as hard as you want to make it. So if, if you're, if you've got the fitness to finish a particular ride or do a thing and you can have a good time doing it, that's, I do have the itch for that all the time. Um, my schedule's just busy, and I suppose like a lot of people, if you don't plan it, if you don't look at a calendar and say, okay, I want to go to Utah and do pressure on the Tesher, uh, or I want to go do Belgian Waffle Ride, or I want to go to Mammoth and, and uh, do this thing, it sort of won't happen. I haven't really gotten to that level of, of you know, pegging events and saying, okay, I'm going to go do this, um, because it just you know, haven't, haven't made it a priority and that's my own fault, but I do have the itch to do some of that. There are times when I'm on rides where I'm, I'm doing certain things and my brain will kick back into cycle right. cross racing or think about stuff, but it, you know, it's just kind of a fleeting moment of right. mostly maybe like a style, like, Oh, when I used to do this, I used to do this this way. And I start but, reminiscing uh, in your head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I don't, I don't have, um, I don't have that, that big itch to go racing. Yeah. So what about 2021 for Sam Barn? 
besides the rock cobbler. Anything else on the agenda? Well, put you on the spot. Yeah, I don't know if there is, but no, is, there, is there anything out there? The, the normal schedule, mm-hmm. uh, non COVID years, and I think the next six months are going to be really interesting for the entire world. Um, I'm feeling confident that you know we'll execute the cobbler. We've got a lot of good plans in place to make that happen. We've had zero point zero zero withdrawals. You know, no, yeah. no, no yeah. nobody's. No, nobody's not wanting to come to get on their bicycle and get some exercise and clear their head and have a little camaraderie. So beyond that, um, Gear Grinder, you know, caters out a couple of events a year. Belgian Waffle is one of them. They've become good friends and, and good business partners. So hopefully those are going to happen and we'll get back out to, to go play with those guys. And um, we do another event in the fall. I, I've sort of shelved like a lot of the other races that we brought to Kern County just because you know, I get tired and I can only do so many things right. in a year. And we had, yes. we were, we were six events a year at one point and it finally just kind of had to give, but we have another gravel event that we did um, in October's uh, called uh, grapes of wrath. And then we rebranded it as gravel arrow. And that year before was really starting to gain, gain some traction, totally different type of ride, less shenanigans, more straightforward, um, but a great venue. Um, and so we'll see if, that's going to pan out for, for October. Should, should, yeah. far enough out. Well, I want to thank you for coming on, and I want to uh, wish Sandbar Promotions best 2021. I know it's going to be good. It'll all work out. It's all going to work out. But thank you so much for coming on. Well, thanks for having me, Johnny. All right. <laughs>